arts at home and abroad. <clears throat> Excuse me, chapter 16. And basically this chapter covers what we call the Harlem Renaissance. Now, the Harlem Renaissance was a flowering of African American social thought. And it was expressed through visual arts as well as through the music. For example, and I'll give you some names that I'll come back and do a little bit more later. Louis Armstrong, Hubie Baker, Fats Waller, Billie Holiday, that's in music. Langston Hughes, Dora Neale Hurston, W.E.B. Du Bois in literature, Paul Robinson in theater, and Josephine Baker in dance. And there were artists and there were people who sculpted and painted. The movement was centered in the Harlem District of New York and was called the New Negro Movement. It had profound influence across the United States as well as the world. From 1920 until about 1930, there was an unprecedented outburst of activity and creativity among the African Americans, and it occurred in all fields of art. This African American movement became known as the New Negro Movement, and only later was it called the Harlem Renaissance. But, you know, it was more than a literary movement and more than just a social revolt against racism. The Harlem Renaissance exalted the unique culture of African Americans and redefined their expression. African Americans were actually encouraged to celebrate their heritage and to become the new Negro, a, coin, a term that was coined in 1925 by the sociologist and critic Alan Leroy Locke. Now, one of the factors contributing to the rise of the Harlem Renaissance was, of course, the great migration of the African Americans to northern cities during World War I. And in his book, The New Negro, uh, Mr. Locke described the northward migration of blacks as something like a spiritual emancipation, a black urban migration, combining with trends in American society and as a whole toward experimentation during the 1920s. And of course, there was the rise of the radical black intellectuals, which included Locke and Marcus Garvey and W.E.B. Du Bois. But even so, they all contributed to this particular style and unprecedented success of black arts during this renaissance. Although Du Bois had been on the scene for a couple of decades now. But this movement grew out of the demand for equality and justice and pride. And it had no clearly defined beginning or end but emerged out of the social and intellectual upheaval in the African-American community that followed World War I. It blossomed in the mid to late 1920s and then faded away in the mid-1930s. While at its core it was primarily a literary movement, although it did touch all creative arts, but its participants shared a commitment to representing honestly and completely the African-American experience and they believed in racial pride and equality. There was no common political philosophy, no social belief, no artistic style, or even a principle bound them all together. It was a movement of individuals, free of any overriding manifesto. And while central to the African American artistic and intellectual life, by no means did it enjoy the full support of the black or white intellectuals it generated as much hostility and criticism as it did support and praise. And from the moment of its birth, its legitimacy was debated. Nevertheless, the Harlem Renaissance was the first time that mainstream publishers and critics took African American literature seriously. And it was the first time that African American literature and the arts attracted significant attention from the nation at large. So many figures are involved in the Renaissance, you'd have to avoid simply categorizing the participants. In the 1920s, mentioned, uh, witnessed a great outpouring of black writing, novels and poetry and plays and, and musicals and nonfiction. And there were serious actors and playwrights. There were musical extravaganzas that were very popular. Uh, Claude McKay was writing about Harlem and Gene Toomer was produced a wonderful book of prose about rural Georgia. And then he disappeared from the scene. Jesse Redmond Faust's characters tended to be very wealthy northern blacks. Nellie Lurson discussed the passing of American, the difficulty of passing of uh, black women passing for uh, white. And Walter White wrote a very haunting novel on the tragic life of the blacks in the South. And there was serious and light poetry. There were some that depicted black American history. Some painted the upper class black life. 
but the talent, creativity, and diversity were remarkable. So participants of this Harlem Renaissance may have indeed been a reflection of confidence, determination, a bit of hopeful and sometimes even cynical about our country. So while Harlem was the black cultural capital, a virtual hive of activity, the Renaissance actually expanded far beyond New York and it came to encompass the entire United States with poetry clubs even from Houston to Dallas to Tallahassee. That being said, let's take a look at what's happening in white America. So immediately after the war, uh, there was a stirring of euphoria, especially in white America and black, gladness that the war was over and our boys were coming home. But among the black community, there was also a feeling of frustration. And then there was that damnable Spanish flu that had killed millions worldwide and tens of thousands here in the U.S. As a matter of fact, over 2,000 died in our own state of Kentucky. There was that fear of communism, that challenge of the workers united overthrow capitalism. And, of course, the usual disillusionment of the aftermath of war. And the countries overseas not wanting to or being unable to repay the United States their war debts. There was massive labor strikes, bomb threats, and attacks against some American leaders. Our own president was bedridden with a massive stroke. And white writers such as Sinclair Lewis and his book Main Street would emphasize the superficiality of the urban American values. And Theodore Dreiser from our state north of us in Indiana, who wrote not only Sister Carrie, but An American Tragedy, about the commercialness of our civilization. I don't know if any of you have read any of those books or not, but I think if you take uh, literature, you may end up having to take Theodore Dreiser and Sister Carrie. And it's not about a nun, in case you haven't read it. Um, it's just the way people talk. As a matter of fact, I call my daughter Sister Sue, and her name isn't Sue. But even American white writers were beginning to write about black situations. You need a, Eugene O'Neill in his All God's Chillin' Got Wings. Frank Time Bomb's Darker Phases of the South. And the American public began being inundated with information and fear. We collectively turned our backs on Europe and the rest of the world. We, we figured we'd been tricked into this war and we settled down to a period of isolation politically. Everything that had happened to our society was blamed on either the communists or those terrible warmongers who had tricked us into getting involved in someone else's war. So you can see the mindset of the American public. Meanwhile, that massive migration that had begun during the war is continuing. And Chicago seems to be the major draw because, well, that's where the opportunity seemed to be. If you got to Chicago, you could make it. But you can't forget New York, because in both cities, cities there were rules about where you could live and work. So the blacks and the whites were separated by culture as well as law. And while major white writers were writing about the black situation and black people, the white public began to become aware of some of the problems and seemed to be willing to listen a little bit. But the Harlem Renaissance, the New Negro Movement, the Black Renaissance, whatever you want to call it, it began in part because the white public was willing to listen, watch, and take seriously the black creator. Now, I sometimes have a problem with the way information is presented in our text, but for the most part, I pretty much concur with this chapter. For instance, uh, it says in there that the black community began to see the discrepancies between the promises of freedom and the reality of their experiences, and they became defiant and bitter and impatient after the war. And of course there were problems because of open hostility, there were riots, and the black people began to push back against the oppression. And of course one of the minor forms of resistance and one that came to be accepted was through literary contributions. And no one can be denied that that charming, interesting individual, Mr. Marcus Garvey, had an effect. You can laugh at him if you want to, but Think about the impact he had on millions of African Americans. Be proud. Be black. Be proud of your roots. You are an African, not a white American. 
and the fact that he angered some of the upper class educated blacks like W.E.B. Du Bois and James Weldon Johnson, who happened to be a secretary of the NAACP, that made it all the better. Uh, perhaps it was a reaction to the inequalities and injustices the Garveys helped point out. Perhaps it was just anger that they had been kept down so long it was welding up. Perhaps it was a reaction to the white writers trying to portray the black life. Perhaps it was just time. But black writers begin to write whether they agreed with Garvey or not. And the experiences they had undergone, first as slaves and then discriminated against and segregated, well, these were unique and common to the black man. Were they bitter? Were they angry? Sure they were. But they all seemed to have a desire and a vision of freedom. Freedom to be their own man, so to speak. Freedom to work. Freedom to be social. The same freedom the white man enjoyed. Bitterness and desire to make the white man confront the fact that America was a racist nation. And not preaching to the world to embrace communism, but they had no intention of undermining the principles of our national government. But a good writer always writes about what he knows best, and who would know the injustices and the cruelty faced by the black people better than black people? A crying out for justice, a cry for change. And here again, I guess I'm guilty of putting the contributors of this period into one lump group. They all did not become crusaders for their people. Some were just expressing their feelings, their creativity in, in art and dance and music, as well as writing. And just as you cannot describe a typical Kentuckian in a few words, you cannot begin to describe the Harlem Renaissance with saying it was a protest. Some did, but some did not. Some Kentuckians are hillbillies. Some are rich, and some are educated, and some are dumb as a brick and a rock. Some writers protested. Some gave us beautiful stories about life in general. Some showed us how to dance. Some showed us beautiful paintings, and some gave us lovely poetry. And some showed us the ugly side of the blacks' lives. And while many, many blacks moved to Chicago to live and work, it was New York, Harlem, that's going to become the center of the new intellectual and cultural lives of the newly conscious black Americans. Actually, we could spend an entire semester on the Harlem Renaissance, and I, I feel bad just devoting one class to it, but somehow it seems to me we're sliding a beautiful period of history. But we've got to keep moving. And my biggest complaint is, and has always been with this text, is the amount of names it gives you. It introduces you to people you've never heard of, along with people you have heard of. And with just a few sentences of information. And there's no way you can possibly remember all the information, especially from this section. And I don't want to slight anyone. And I'm sure I'm going to miss some. I'm not going to mention everything that's in the text. I'm going to mention some that are not in the text. And if you are an avid reader, you may be familiar with more of the written works and been to in schools in the past few decades. Uh, we featured some black writers. And I think most of you are probably familiar with Beloved, for instance, in part thanks to Oprah Winfrey. We had to read it in black history, and I even had my students read it in one black history class. Very confusing. Uh, but when you get right down to it, Oprah Winfrey did a lot to bring black writers to the public's attention, like Toni Morrison. Now, if you're into music, such as jazz or the blues, you'll be familiar with some of the names. And I don't believe there are any old black and white or silent film buffs in my class, but if there are, uh, you won't be surprised at the films that were produced and acted in by blacks. Of course, you're all familiar with the black stars of today, and the difference today is we go to see a film because a good actor is playing the part, not because you got a black actor. Of course, my personal favorites are Morgan Freeman and Denzel Washington. And of course, we all know the most famous black director of the day, Spike Lee. But a combination of events, the Great Migration of Blacks from the South, immigration of the blacks from the West Indies, and the Citizens Protective League, and the growing economic pressure of the uh, black community. Well, maybe pressure isn't the right word. I guess you'd say presence, because we're getting a very large, growing middle class of blacks. And we have the movement of famous intellectuals like W.E.B. Du Bois to New York. And you know, all these factors come together and contribute 
New York becomes the mecca of intellectual and creative focus of the black community. There was no one event that caused the firing. It was a series of events over a decade. After leaving today, if you're white and you have ambitions, if you want to be successful in the arts or literary world, you go to New York City. There is the place to begin. And so it was with the blacks. Now, some, like W.E.B. Du Bois, a protest worker, not worker, but writer, and Johnson, known for his poetry, had published, and you had, we've talked about them before, and they were famous before the move. But your text author claims that the climate was congenial to literature development in Harlem. And it's pointing out there's no serious riots. There's just a mild flirting with socialism. It was much more prominent with the white community than the black community. And I'm going to give you a listing of names now. Uh, some of these are in your text. Some of them are not. James Weldon Johnson. Known for his poetry. He's credited with being the pompier. It's a French word, really, and if you looked it up, it means a uh, father or a leader. So Johnson is given credit by our text authors for being the father of the Harlem Renaissance. He wrote poetry, and he edited other people's works, and in his autobiography, he actually credits Claude McKay as being the premier writer of the time. The man was a college graduate and was not a native-born American. He was born in Jamaica. Not only was he a poet, but he also wrote novels as well. Another name, Jean Toomer, who studied in France. And he's credited with being one of the most talented writers of the period. But, and he wrote stories full of love and pride of the black race. Conti Callan, very talented man, a poet, son of a minister, and son-in-law of W.E.B. W. E. Du Bois. So he was in a very talented circle to begin with. Langston Hughes. He composed poetry that was very prideful, and he also wrote novels and plays, and had been called the Shakespeare of Harlem. Jesse Redmond Fawcett. Ah, really good-looking lady. She attended Cornell and the University of Pennsylvania. She translated works from the French to English and wrote novels. She did, didn't just write about slavery and bad times. She wrote of pride and things not involving race problems. She was a true novelist. Walter White were the problems of a black woman trying to pass as white. Nella Larson were the problems trying to move upward for blacks in America as well as in Europe. Walter Thurman, Eric Walrod, Randolph Fisher, George S. Schuler, they're all producing novels during the 1920s. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention their names, but I'm sure you've never heard of them before you read this chapter. But what of nonfiction? Yeah, there was some of that going on too. Uh, the Crisis Magazine, you know, the uh, magazine of the uh, NAACP. And Du Bois was writing, offering prizes to people who would write and submit their work. But sometimes it takes a monetary incentive to get a smoothie, you know. And there were articles in the magazine and essays written by people other than Du Bois and Johnson. So now, of course, there's a stage. Now, blacks had been on the stage for a long time, playing a part, of course, that would not offend the white audience. But now the blacks are on the stage playing to black audiences and they can spread their wings, so to speak. They perform dramas and comedies and even the classics. And in 1917, a black group presented in the Garden Theater in Madison Square Garden. It was well received, but the timing was kind of bad because we entered the war at that time and all attention was focused at that then overseas. Charles Gilpin, he became the best known black actor on stage. There were others, and ironically, it was in plays written about black people by white people, like Porgy. That the black actor became known and accepted. Your uh, Abraham Bosom, The Emperor Jones, and Green Pastures, these are all plays about black people written by white people. The serious writing and acting for an abundance. And there was a lighter side. Of course, there was vaudeville. And of course, the white community had always accepted blacks doing comedy. As long as they were making fun of themselves. But in 1921, Shuffle Along and an African American review that included such songs as I'm Just Wild About Harry and Harry's Just Wild About Me. The settings and the costumes were fabulous. It was written, directed, and played by blacks. 
It was enormously successful, and it was followed by others. In 1926, a new innovation, a very talented black woman named Florence Mills, she broke the tradition of the all-male performers, and actually broke the way and paved the path for people like Ethel Walters and Josephine Baker. But what about jazz? Scott Joplin, composer, pianist, king of ragtime. Uh, I have a little U uh, YouTube part. I was going to play the uh, entertainer, but I think I played something else. Jelly Roll Morton, composer, pianist, he father of the New Orleans Brews, blues. Josephine King Oliver. I supposed to be composer, not contest. And he also introduced jazz to Chicago. Louis Armstrong. He was a movie actor and a trumpet player, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on Louis Armstrong because he's one of my favorite people. He was born in New Orleans on August the 4th, 1901. One of two children born to Willie Armstrong, a turpentine worker, and Marianne Armstrong, whose grandparents had been slaves. And at a very young life, he was singing on the streets with friends, and he was having a good old time. But his parents separated, and, well, his parents didn't separate. His dad left, just took off. His mother, trying to raise the children, was not always successful, but so he had to live with his sister, mother, and grandmother over the rundown area of New Orleans known as the battlefield because of the gambling, drunkenness, fighting, and shooting. His mother, she worked sometimes as a part-time prostitute. Whenever she couldn't get a job to make money to feed her kids, she would do the thing, you know. 1913, when he was just 12 years old, uh, he was arrested for firing a gun in the air on New Year's Eve. He was sent to a reform school where he took up the cornet, which is kind of like a trumpet, and learned how to play in the band there. Now, one thing, when he was young, before this episode happened and he had to go to the reform school, uh, he had got a job riding on a coal wagon delivering coal to the richer people. And he would have to toot this horn to blow and let him know that the coal truck was there. This was his job, toot on a horn. And one of the places he delivered to was a very wealthy Jewish family. And they liked Louie. He was a nice little kid, and they, they took to him, and he had a good meal, and they always made sure he got presents, and he really looked, remembered them all his life. But another place that was interesting that he also delivered coal to was uh, a brothel. They liked him, too, and he learned the, the ways of the area and also learned to listen to the music that they played there. So he wasn't completely unknown to the... Uh, blowing of horns, so to speak, when he was in the reform school where he learned how to play a little bit better. And after he was released, he worked at odd jobs. He began performing with a local group. He was defended by a man called Joseph Joe King Oliver, who was a leader of a great African-American band. He also was making records. And Joe gave him a trumpet and gave him trumpet lessons and let him join his band and took him with him to Chicago in 1922 where he remained for two years and then he went on to New York City to play with another band. When he came back to Chicago in the fall of 25, he organized his own band and began to record one of the greatest series in the history of jazz. In 1928, he started recording with another drummer and a pianist and their skills seemed to match his. He, he was well known for his timing. The recordings were masterpieces at this time. He also was working with the big bands of Chicago, and, and his vocals began to be featured on records after 1925. He played the trumpet and sang. I also have a uh, brief YouTube of him. I, I've tried in the past to embed the YouTubes in the uh, PowerPoints, and when I'm just showing them, it's fine, but when I have them processed through YouTube and then brought back down, they won't play. You'll hear the audio, but the video won't play. So I, I apologize for not being able to insert the videos in the proper place. He also had a rather unique style of singing, very throaty style. He was what they call the inventor of what they call scat singing, which is a random use of just stupid syllables. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And it all came about because when he was playing and trying to sing, he dropped the music and he didn't know the words, so he just started making noises. And it caught up. By 1929, Armstrong was in New York City in a nightclub band and appearing in a theatrical review. 
They ain't misbehaving. He performed a lot of popular song material after this, and um, some very notable performances. His playing reached the peak around 1933. And he began taking a little bit different approach and started touring Europe. In 1947, well, the Big Ben era ended. Uh, it kind of ended after the war, yeah. Uh, so he went back to leading a small group and he got some first class musicians and uh, during the 30s he, he achieved international fame. He started touring Europe as a soloist and singer and after the war uh, ended in 1948 he went to France and became a, became a constant world traveler. He went to Africa and Europe and Japan, Australia and South America. He also began appearing in musical films in the 50s and one of the ones that I remember is Bing Crosby. Uh, we sometimes think of Louis Armstrong as a vaudeville entertainer, but the man was phenomenal. He was the type of man that he walked into the room with that big old smile of his, and you couldn't help but smile. Now, I never did like jazz music until I heard him play, and there was just something about Louis Armstrong that you just fell in love with. Good-looking young man. Good-looking young man. Of course... They're spirituals. Now, do you know what a spiritual is? Uh, it's a religious song relating to the human spirit and a religion associated usually with black Southern Christians. And it's usually about life being bad here, but it's going to be better later on. And I think one of the most famous spirituals is one you probably all know. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. And of course, the early spirituals were used to, you know, Secret communications and messages from the slaves seen on the plantations. And they uh, kind of a call and response, which became characteristic of the gospel singing. Some, like I said, used it as a method of communication, sending secret messages. Some saw it simply as a cry for freedom and justice. But the name I want you to remember is Henry Thacker Berlou. If you can't remember, you can think of Blue Avenue there in Owensboro. He was born in 1866, the year the Civil War ended, and he died in 1949. He was born in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. His mother was a domestic worker, and she was a maid to Mrs. Elizabeth Russell. And Mrs. Elizabeth Russell was a very hoity-toity, richy lady, and she had uh, performers in her home and concerts. And this was one of the things the upper class did back in those days. And she allowed young Henry to attend, and his interest in music, of course, was awakened at a very early age. He began singing in the choir at St. Paul in the Park Presbyterian Church, as well as the Reformed Jewish Temple. He was always singing, but he was smart enough to know he couldn't make any money singing, so he got a job as a stenographer to support his family. So when he was 26, he moved to New York, and that's about the time the Harlem Renaissance began. He won a scholarship to the National Conservatory of Music. And while studying there, he was introduced to a lot of noted musicians who all were taken by his voice. One performer uh, that was there from Czechoslovakia heard him sing, and he just couldn't believe it when he heard him sing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. In 1894, he became the baritone soloist at St. George's Episcopal Church. And in 96, he had completed his studies. He got married a couple of years later, and he had a son, and he continued singing, and received enough money from his singing to allow him to continue to study and compose. His grandfather had sung him spirituals as a young boy, and, and he kind of liked them. So the spirituals he was composing became very popular and caught on not only with black, but with white musicians as well. And he used to say, I can't take credit for them because they were songs that my grandfather heard when he was working in the cotton fields, and he relayed them to me, and he just improved on them. He continued to sing and compose throughout his life. He was fortunate enough to make enough money through the sales of his work to uh, be able to travel. He finally had to retire in 46, and his son placed him in a nursing home where he died a couple of years later. But the African-American tradition of spirituals and sacred music had continued and changed from Re Reconstruction to the present. The religious themes that were at the heart of the early spirituals continued with gospel, blues, and even pop singers. And Marian Anderson was the most famous singer of her era, but she didn't sing spiritual. She was a classically trained opera singer. Uh, I've got to 
songs here. Uh, Sonic, sometimes I feel like a mother's child. And nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Uh, I think I've got the words to that here somewhere. I'm not even going to try to sing it to it because I've got... Sometimes I feel like a motherless child a long ways from home. Sometimes I feel like I'm gonna, almost gone a long way from home. Uh, very sad when you start singing it. But I think that when you probably know is nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. And I thought I had it here. And I guess I don't. That irritates me. Hmm. Oh, here he is. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Oh, yes, Lord. Sometimes I'm almost to the ground. Oh, yes, Lord. Oh, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. If you get there before I do, oh, yes, Lord, tell my friends I'm a coming too. Oh, yes, Lord, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that to you. Marian Anderson. Now there is a beautiful woman. She was born in February of 1897 in Philadelphia. And like so many of our singers, even today, she got her start singing in church. And she had a voice that wouldn't stop. She could hit the high notes, she could hit the low notes. And the people at her church took up a collection and had a fundraiser and gave her money for lessons. In 1925, she competed in a contest against 300 others to sing with the New York Philharmonic, and she won. And she went on to England and France to study and gave concerts. 1939, she'd been contacted to do a concert in Washington, D.C., and the Daughters of the American Revolution, the D.A.R., canceled it because she was black. Well, the president's wife, Mrs. Roosevelt, was outraged. And she resigned her membership and uh, made arrangements with her husband to have Marion give a performance outside of the Lincoln Memorial. And I do have a uh, brief, she's just singing one song uh, of our active, actual recording this week, of course, been re-digitalized. And it's of a special, I guess you'd say it's special to me, and it explains it why on the uh, little thing. I get goosebumps whenever I hear her sing it, and it brings back good memories because... She didn't sing it. I had someone else sing it who was an opera singer at my wedding. Yeah, I had a white wedding. But she refused to sing anywhere segregated. And when you hear her voice, you'll just, oh, wow. 1955, she performed with the Metropolitan Opera Company. And in 56, just a year later, she did a farewell tour in America and Europe and stopped singing. But she didn't die until 1993 at the age of 96. And she's considered the world's greatest contralto. Beautiful women with a voice she opens her mouth. You think, did that come out of her? Now, W.C. Handy, for you people who live there. <laughs> I guess I should have proved this a little bit better. He was born in November the 16th of 1873, not 111, in Florence, Alabama. Now, W.C. Handy was, uh, well, he actually grew up in a log cabin. His grandfather built. And he... He just played a very early interest in music. He liked to listen to the boat whistles. He liked to listen to the music of the birds. Um, he could add it to catalog songbird songs. He had musical talent. But his daddy frowned on anything playing music because according to daddy, any kind of music like that, if it wasn't sung in church, it was sung in brothels and that was bad. But despite lack of encouragement, he, he wanted a guitar. He'd seen one in a local shop window, and he had secretly saved the money he made by picking berries and nuts and making my soap. And when he finally saved up enough money, he bought the guitar, and he proudly brought it home to his shocked and very dismayed father. And Handy's father said, no, no. He made him take the guitar back and exchange it for a dictionary, which he said would do him much more good. Well, Handy joined a local blues band when he was a teenager, but he didn't let his parents know about it. And with a little bit of money he made, he purchased a cornet from a fellow band member and spent every three minutes practicing. He was an exceptional student in school. He graduated and placed near the top of his class. In September of 1892, he traveled to Birmingham, Alabama to take a teaching exam, which he passed. He got a teaching job in Birmingham, but it didn't take him long to learn that teachers don't make a lot of money, especially black teachers in the South. <laughs> 
So we quit the position and found work as a pipe worker in a plant in nearby uh, Bessemer. But during his off time, he uh, organized a very small string quartet and taught musicians how to read notes. Then he formed a quartet. And when the group read about the upcoming World Fair in Chicago, they decided this is we got to go to. So the trip to Chicago was long and arduous, and to pay their way, they, they performed at odd jobs along their way and played. They finally arrived in Chicago only to learn that the, <laughs> the World's Fair had been postponed for a year. So they headed back to St. Louis, working along the way. He finally left them when he got to Evansville because he, they were giving him such a hard time. But he had worked in St. Louis, and he played in seven, Evansville, Indiana. I'm sure you've heard of Evansville. And his luck changed quite dramatically. He uh, managed to join a very successful band in Evansville and began playing throughout the neighboring cities and states. He was even asked to perform at a local barbecue just across the river at a place called Henderson, Kentucky. And there he met his future wife. And thus, that's why Henderson has a W.C. Handy Festival every year, because Handy never lived in Henderson. But his wife is from Henderson. They did get married, and... Uh, He went back to Chicago where he joined a group called the Mar Marsh's Minstrels. He began traveling around, but uh, yeah, the traveling bands weren't that respected. And his you know, his wife and he went back to Chicago where he got a job with another minstrel show with a big money of $6 a week. Worked there for three years. Then they went southwest through Texas and Oklahoma and did a lot of traveling. They finally settled in Huntsville, Alabama for a rest, and that's where... They gave birth to the first of their six children. And while he was in Florence, he was approached by a president of the Agricultural Mechanical College in Normal, Alabama, about coming to be a teacher. Well, the university was one of the two black colleges in the state at the time, the other being Tuskegee. So he accepted the offer and became a faculty member. And it didn't take him very long. He decided that this is not the way to go. Uh, he was underpaid. Uh, and the music that they wanted him to teach, they wanted him to teach classical music. He didn't like that, so he resigned and joined the Minstrels to tour the States again. In 1903, he received an offer to direct a black band in Clarksdale, Mississippi. He stayed there for six years. In 1909, he moved to Memphis, Tennessee, where they established his headquarters at a place called Beale Street. And his years of observing the reactions of white people to native black music as well as his own, uh, he began to affect his music and he would end up sparking something he was going to call the blues. That's why we call him the father of the blues. He composed a type of song, and one of the campaign songs, as a matter of fact, for a man called Crump, a Memphis candidate for mayor. And uh, the song, Mr. Crump, after the election, he changed it and called it Memphis Blues, which became very popular. It was a huge success. Published it in 1912, and he sold the rights for $100. He had to have the money. But at the age of 40, he published his most famous composition, the St. Louis Blues. He began to write and publish, and his popularity soared. He opened his own uh, publishing business. Worked steadily through the 30s. He started having trouble with his eyes. He'd been sensitive since he was a child, but now with all the demands of the work and everything, uh, it took a toll. In 1943, he lost his balance and fell at subway station and actually caused him to go totally blind. But he was working laboriously and compiling blues tunes, which he published and composing them. His wife had died in 1937, and later he married another lady in 1954 when he was 80 years old. In 80, uh, 1955, he suffered a stroke and was confined to a wheelchair, but he was still popular. And on his 84th birthday, a party was held at the Waldorf Astoria with more than 800 people attending. He died in 1954. And they said that when they took the motorcade down the street, more than 150,000 people lined the streets. But W.C. Handy has been called the father of the blues because he basically single-handedly introduced the new style of music to the world. He said he did not invent the blues, but he merely transcribed what he had seen and heard. They do have a plaque for him in Florence, Alabama, and like I say, Henderson has a W.C. Handy Blues Festival every year. I think it's in June, yeah, either late May or early June. 
you get a chance to go, you really should because it's free. And they have visiting uh, blues bands from all over. Just take your lawn chair and something to eat. And they also have good barbecues over there. Not as good as Owensboro, of course, but uh, they have good barbecues. They, it's a good way to be entertained and not have to put out a bunch of money. I want to mention a few more. Uh, Aaron Douglas was an illustrator and he painted a series of murals for the New York Public Library. He taught at the Fisk University. Henry Oswald Tanner is an outstanding painter, and his paintings are hung all over Europe and even one in the White House. Oscar Michelou, and your tech spends quite a bit of time on him, black film producer and distributor. Of course, we had the black nightclubs, a place where the white people like to go. And it's also during Prohibition, and they could knock three times and whisper Joe. And of course, there's a Savoy Club and the Cotton Club, which catered to whites, but it was <laughs> operated by Jewish gangsters and... Uh, Black people worked there, and they had the black dancers and the black waiters, but black people could not be served in the front door. Niggeretti, a term coined by Zora Neale Hurston. She said this was what the white people were that tried to come down and act like black people. And while we've got all this booze going on and prohibition and jazz and the, and the nightclubs, we also have literary parties in Harlem. As a matter of fact... Uh, <laughs> Madam C.J. Walker even hosted a few of them, and one of the more famous things, like Clarence Darrow, was there, and at one time, even the British nobility could be found wandering around. And can't you just see the scene of the future king of England caught in a raid, and, you know, and the hostess had to put him in the kitchen to pretend to be a cook to keep him from going to jail? And black writers began to have a sense of belonging with all this intermingling with the whites. And although most of the better-known artists came out of Harlem, we have people writing in Georgia and Boston, Virginia, and even Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Joseph Sinton Cotter, Jr., uh, unfortunately, he died at a very young age of 24. They were also writing in Chicago and Houston, Detroit, and even California. So what's that say about the movement? It may have begun in Harlem, but it had spread all over the country. And who can say what would have happened if the stock market had not crashed? In 1930, Claude McKay was spending his life in France. Langston Hughes had continued his world tours, and James Weldon Johnson had become a college professor at Fisk University in Tennessee. The country is in a deep depressive depression. And our new president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, tried his best to get us out of it. He established a multitude of agencies to give work to tens of thousands of people who had none because of the closing of their business. It was an alphabet of organizations, the WPA, the CCC, the FDIC, the AAA, the TVA, the FSA, and we'll get into that next chapter. But it was the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, that funded a federal project for the arts. It would be the first time in the beginning of federal money touching the arts at all. People were paid to write, to paint, to take pictures. And it was through this project that many black writers could continue to write and even receive some sort of money. They were also hired people to go out and interview ex-slaves. And there are some beautiful interviews that have even yet not been completely translated in the, uh, museum, in the museums at, in Washington. Some of the well-known writers did continue to write, such as Langston Hughes and Dunty Cullen and Du Bois, but these people also had other means of support. But it was Zora Neil Hurston who seemed to thrive during the 30s. She was a trip, and although this picture shows her to be a very attractive, smiling young lady, she didn't always dress like this. She liked to dress outlandishly. She liked to wear long, flowing uh, clothes and drink funny things and wear scarves around her head. She was a trip from the word go. But she was born uh, January the 7th, 1891 in Alabama. Her parents were former slaves and her father did become a minister and her mother died when she was very young. And once her father remarried, she kind of moved around and lived with assortment of family members. But to support herself and get money to an education, she worked at a variety of jobs, including one as a maid for an actress who was touring in the Gilbert and Sullivan group. In 1920, she actually earned her associate's degree from Howard University and began publishing one of her earliest works in the university's newspaper. Then she moved to New York neighborhood. And of course, the Harlem Renaissance is going on. And she became a fixture 
in the areas thriving our industry. But living in Harlem in the 1920s, she actually was befriended by Langston Hughes and County Collin, uh, among a lot of others. Uh, they were in her apartment. She went to see them. Uh, she was very popular. And she began experiencing a few early literary successes, uh, some short stories and playwriting. But she had serious academic interests, and she actually got a scholarship to Menard College where she pursued the subject of anthropology and studied with the famous anthropologist Franz Boas. In 27, she returned to Florida to collect African-American folk tales, and she would later publish a collection called uh, Mules and Men. About the mid-30s, she explored the fine arts through a number of different projects. She worked with Lance and Hughes in a play, but they got into it and they had a falling out, and she eventually went on to write her own plays. She released her first novel, Joe was Gord Vine in 34, and two years later, uh, she received a Guggenheim Fellowship, which allowed her to work on what would become her most famous novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. She wrote the novel while traveling in Haiti, where she was studying local voodoo practices. Um, the uh, niece of Miss Houston actually visited the OCC campus about three years ago. 1937, she travels to Haiti, studied voodoo practices, and went on to Jamaica on an anthropological research trip also. In 42, she published her autobiography, and uh, it wasn't very well received, but her life and career did begin to falter. And then she was charged in 1948 with molesting a 10-year-old boy. And she was able to prove that she wasn't even in the country at the time of the incident, but you know how people are. Where there's smoke, there's fire. And her popularity and career suffered greatly from this false accusation. But despite all she was able to accomplish, she struggled financially and personally during her last decade. She kept writing, but she had difficulty getting it published. And a few years later, she suffered a stroke while she and wound up living in the St. Louis County Welfare Home. Our once famous writer, and who is associated with all the famous intellectuals of New York, died poor, died alone, January the 20th, 1960. She was actually buried in an unmarked grave in Fort Pierce, Florida. Toni Morrison later said it would be her sin that had influenced her and got her to write. So many, many are not even mentioned. Scott Joplin, I mentioned briefly, and like I said, I do have a brief thing. I've got uh, Scott Joplin, uh, Marie, Marian Anderson, uh, Louis Armstrong. I think those are the only three. I have to look to see, find out. Billie Holiday, Josephine Baker, Bessie Smith. Oh, I got a cute story to tell you about Bessie Smith. Bessie Smith was a small lady and very, very feisty. And one time when she was having a uh, concert, under in a tent out in Alabama somewhere, the local Ku Klux Klan heard about it, and they were going to show up, and they were going to show this little black girl what's what. And she got so angry, she went after them with a bat, baseball bat and ran them off. <laughs> Feisty woman. And of course, there's uh, Duke Ellington, uh, the gentleman who was trained to be a classical pianist and wound up being a blues and jazz pianist. There's dozens more in the text I did not mention, and there's some in, I mentioned that's not in the text. Your text even tells you about Jesse Reese Europe, and we discussed him a bit during the World War I, and I've always wondered what he might have accomplished had he not been murdered. And of course, after the war, in the stock market crash in the 30s, France became the mecca for the black musicians. If you go online and just type Harlem Renaissance, and you're going to be blown totally away about all the names and contributions that are going to come up. I don't want to, but we're going to have to leave this section. And I normally, when I'm on campus, it takes at least two to three class periods to cover this because OCC's library has a Ken Burns eight hour history of jazz DVD. If you can get a chance, you can check it out. It's not just for teaching. It's got some original recordings that are just phenomenal, and it gives you the uh, biographies of so many of the famous people, and you can actually see them and hear them. I encourage you to try. Uh, you can go online and find out a lot of stuff and hear a lot of good music, but it, it's just not the same. 
It's, I don't want to leave this section, but we've got to move on. And your text closes this section by relating how W.E.B. Du Bois was well, he's very critical of the Negro art of the age. He, he didn't like jazz. And Conti Collin just laid it on the line. He thought that all this writing and, and painting and sculpting and the representations of the African Americans were, well, you were making the white Americans see them as being a racist and a stereotype. Uh, you write about what you know. If that's all you've seen, that's what you're going to write about, good, bad, or ugly. But the stock market crash. And not only did it take away the white man's feeling of upward mobility that we'd always had, it dashed the aspirations and dreams of the African Americans. Your text states that long-standing inequalities and malfeasance in the American economy had finally come home like chickens to roost. And so we have the dawn of a devastating decade, the Depression years. So next time we'll talk about the New Deal, our president's efforts to try to get us out of it, the 1930s.